She asked, did you face a day harder and more intense than the battle of Bukhar? And the Prophet wasallam he replies in the affirmative. He says that there was such a day. What was the hardest day in the life of the Prophet wasallam? He said that it was the day of Al-Aqaba, which was the day when he went with his companion Zayd anhu, and they went to the city of Taif to spread the message of Islam. And they went there hoping that they would be able to deliver this message and they would receive it positively. But not only did the people of Taif reject his message, but they completely and utterly turned him out. They humiliated him, they attacked him, they harassed him in every way possible. That the humiliation that the Prophet ﷺ endured on that day was such that they, would, they, were ordering, they were having their children throw rocks at their feet. And it was so much, so severe that his feet would be bleeding and the blood was such that it would get stuck to his soles of his, of his, of his uh, shoes. So he finds shelter, someone from outside the town helps him out, gives him some place to rest and you know, heal up for a bit before making the journey back to Mecca. And then while he's on this journey back, after he's had such a severe experience, the hardest moment of his life and now he's having to make this journey back completely failing in his ordeal he makes a supplication to the sky he supplicates to Allah and then the angel Jibra'il comes to him and says I have brought Allah has sent to you the angel of the mountains he has heard what you have said and he has seen what has happened to you so he has sent you the angel of the mountains to command and the angel of the mountain says to the Prophet wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I am the angel of these mountains. If you order me, if you just say the word, I will crush these people after what they have done. And what did the Prophet wasallam say? He says, no, very good. That maybe from among their progeny, there will be people who understand. And, you know, the city of Taif eventually became Muslim and from that city came many people who spread Islam across the world. 
What is the legacy of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What is the legacy, the Sunnah that we follow? That this was a man who at every opportunity he had, he showed the most exemplary character. He espoused the principles of mercy and patience, rahmah. There are people around the world who would dishonor that name, that would do crazy things in the name of Islam, that would do crazy acts of violence. And this is not from our tradition. That when the Prophet ﷺ, any opportunity that he had to hurt people, to inflict suffering, he always said no. He always said that no, maybe there will be understanding in the future, or let me show mercy. But this is the example that we are supposed to follow. What is the legacy that we follow? What is the sunnah of the man that we claim to be a follower of? Do we truly follow it? Do we truly appreciate it? The dua that people often share this hadith, but they don't share the actual dua that he gave. The dua that he gave is actually very interesting because I think it, it summarizes his character in many ways. That when he's in this moment, he raises his hand to the sky and he says, Allahumma ilayka ashku du'fa quwwati To you my lord, I complain of my weakness Wa qilla tahilati Lack of support Wa hawani ala nas And the humiliation I am made to receive That anyone can do anything to me To put this in context, the Prophet wasallam, He's from a noble lineage He's you know, in the cultural sense, he's, a, he's like an aristocrat. And the city of Taif is like a secondary city. It's not as highly ranked in the hierarchy as Makkah is. So for them to be doing this is even from a cultural standpoint wrong. Ya Arham Rahimin, O most merciful of those who give mercy. Anta Rabbul Muskadafin, you are the Lord of the weak. وَأَنْتَ رَبِّي And you are my Lord إِلَى مَنْ تَفِلْنِي إِلَى بَعِيدٍ To whom do you leave me? إِلَى بَعِيدٍ يَتَجَحَّمُنِي To a distant person who receives me with hostility He's complaining to Allah Right? He's, he's you know أَمْ إِلَى عَدُوٍ مَلَّكَتَهُ أَمْرِي Or to an enemy you have given power over me. And then what does he say? Illam yakum beka alayya ghadabun. As long as you are not displeased with me, fala obali. I do not care what I face. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He gives someone hardship, it can either be from because Allah is angry at the person. Or to elevate that person, to give him a trial, to bring you know good out of him, to see if he can you know raise to a higher level. Prophet is saying, as long as you are not angry with me, then I do not care what I face. I will accept it. This is the level of taqwa that he's showing. Walakin <laughs> I would, however, be much happier with your mercy. li I seek refuge in the light of your face by which all darkness is dispelled and both this life and the life to come are put in the right course against incurring your wrath. This is what he's saying. And then he's saying, if you are angry, well, أن تنزل بي غضبك أو يحل علي سخطك لك To you I submit until I earn your pleasure That if you are indeed angry at me for something I have done Then I submit to you until I earn your pleasure حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك Everything is powerless without your support And what does this teach us? And when the Prophet ﷺ is in his darkest moment, in his most difficult time, that think to when you have been 
through a very difficult ordeal, when something very troubling has happened to you, when you have been struggling with something, that what was going through your mind, what goes through our minds when we're struggling? It's not easy. When we're at our lowest, oftentimes there's thoughts of negativity, thoughts of depression. Nothing positive is coming out. It's hard for me to think, oh, Alhamdulillah. It's hard for me to say, I will be patient through this. But this is the sunnah, this is the legacy that the Prophet ﷺ leaves for us to aspire to. That when I say that the Prophet ﷺ espoused principles of patience and rahmah, what does it mean? It's not just some abstract word that you know, sounds eloquent. But when I say patient, what do I mean? That when he's being tried with these difficult ordeals, that no matter what is being thrown at him, he says, Ya Allah, I accept whatever you throw at me, whatever you give me, because it is from you. There's a verse in Surah Al-Hadid, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا That there does not befall anything on this earth or amongst yourselves, except that it is in a book already written beforehand. And what's the significance of this? لِكَيْ لَا تَعْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ So that you do not get anxious, <coughs> agitated about you know, bad things that befall you. Or you do not get exultant, overly excited about good things that happen to you. you know, that we accept what Allah gives us. And that's, that's taqwa. And when I say mercy, what do I mean by that? That when the Prophet is in a position to get retribution for what has been done to him, what does he do? He chooses not to. That whenever you or I are in a position where someone has wronged us, someone has hurt us, someone has said something to hurt our feelings, and then later on we find ourselves we're in a position to get retribution in some form. We can get justice for whatever happened. We can get them back. What is the better choice to make? It is better to choose mercy, to choose forgiveness, than to choose that. What is the sunnah that you follow? There's people in this world who do crazy things in the name of our religion. And this is going to happen, this has happened in the past, and this is going to happen in the future. And we have to be careful. <coughs> We have to be careful not to get caught in a trap. Now whenever something happens, some act of terrorism, anything happens, often the reaction is that we have all these organizations, all these leaders saying, you know, we condemn acts of violence, we condemn this. There's nothing wrong with that, that's true. And often we find ourselves saying that we Muslims, we are not violent, we are not this. We do not do these things, we're not that. <coughs> But what's the problem there? There's a few problems. One, if we're constantly saying, we are not this, I am not that, then what are you? If you're constantly saying what you aren't, then you're not going to get a chance to define who you are. And that's what's more important. That this goes to an individual level when we're thinking about what we need to be doing is defining who Muslims are. That what is a Muslim? Who is someone who follows the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? Such a person should be a person who has the most exemplary character. Who in their workplace, in their school, in their offices, in any setting, is honest, is nice, is compassionate, is trustworthy, is these things. This is the legacy that we need to be standing up, that we need to be representing. It's dangerous because there's often this onus that is placed upon minorities that they need to somehow prove that they're not this. Now throughout history this has been a standard thing that's happened. During the civil rights movement, people who are African American need to have, somehow have the responsibility of convincing everyone that they're not violent. That, you know, during the Colonial, during uh, the 18th century, somehow Irish Americans need to convince people that they're not violent. Somehow during World War II, the onus is on Japanese to convince people that they're not going to do anything weird. 
This doesn't make any sense. The idea that I'm responsible for something that someone who I have no relation to across the world did doesn't make any sense. And we need to not get caught up in that. There's nothing wrong with condemning things. There's nothing wrong with, you know, saying these things. But what we need to be aware of is that the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ is a legacy that he didn't do things to impress people. He didn't do things to make people think, oh yeah, Muslims are nice people. He did things because it was the right thing to do. And we need to not get caught up in that. That oftentimes we find ourselves thinking, I need to be nice and this and this and this, so that the people in my workplace, people there, don't think that Muslims are weird. I need to convince them that Muslims are good. No. What you need to do, what I need to do, the only thing we need to worry about is Allah. We need to do things for the sake of Allah. Right? And what do I mean by that? When the Prophet ﷺ, when he captures Makkah, what is he? Does he say, oh, if I let these people go, these people have abused me, these people have harassed me, tortured me, they've kicked my people out of my own birthplace, and now I've come back with my army and I've captured them. And they're scared, what am I going to do to them? If I let them go, they'll be impressed and then they'll become Muslim. No, that's not what he was thinking. His approach was, I let them go, I have mercy on them because it's the right thing to do. And it's subtle, but it's important for me to have this consciousness that I have to do right for the sake of doing right, not for any other reason. Not to impress anyone, not because of anything that anyone thinks. For myself, I need to do right. right? As an individual, it's a responsibility upon all of us to do right by people. To be compassionate like the Prophet ﷺ was compassionate. That Many Sahaba, many people used to think that they were the Prophet ﷺ's favorite person because he was so kind and nice to everyone that he met that everyone thought that he liked them the most. That to be charitable like the Prophet ﷺ, are you charitable like that? That when a gift of a goat was given to the Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? He slowly broke up pieces of it as people came and donated pieces of it away. Until what? Until the neck was left. And Aisha Razila Anha, she says, Ya Rasulullah, only the neck is left. What are we going to eat? And what does he say? He says, Ya Aisha, everything except the neck is there. That this was the level of charity, the level of, 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 of compassion that he had, that anyone asked anything from him, he would give it. No matter how impoverished he was, no matter how much he needed something, that he was always thinking about others before himself. Whose legacy do you follow? Whose sunnah do you practice? This is the sunnah of our Prophet <coughs> Be wise like the Prophet was wise. That when he used to talk, there was intelligence coming from him. There was a sense of strategy behind his actions, that he didn't just do things haphazardly. Every person that he talked to, he talked to on their own level. He didn't talk to them in the same way. He talked to them in a way that they needed to hear. When, that when, when, a, uh, when, a, man, when a young man came to the Prophet ﷺ asking, Ya Rasulullah, I want to perform zina. I want to have relations with someone. <coughs> what did he say? The Prophet ﷺ talked to him in a way that he understood. He understood that this man was going through a difficult time, that he was agitated. He understood what he was feeling. He put his hand on his chest, right? And then he gave the example, would you want this for your sister? Would you want this for your, uh, for your mother? And so on. He says, no, Ya Rasulullah. And then he makes dua for the man. And then the man never did something like that ever. But this was the way he used to engage people. He understood where they were coming from. And he talked to them on that level. That are you wise like the Prophet You follow that legacy. This is something that we need to be thinking about. <coughs> that to what extent am I meeting these standards that he has set for us? It's not enough for me to just be who I am, go to work day in and out, go to school, go to whatever, and not really be a part of the general society, not really be caring for other people. I need to be caring for what other people are going through. I need to be thinking about what other people are going through before myself. As the Prophet ﷺ said that none of you will believe until you 
desire for your brother what you desire for yourself? Are you, am I living up to that? Am I living up to that legacy? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There's a conversation between Musa alayhi salam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is really remarkable that I want to share. That Qatada narrates that Musa alayhi salam said, he's talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he said, My Lord, I find in the tablets the mention of an ummah that is the best of ummah ever evolved for the guidance of mankind, who enjoins good and forbids wrong. My Lord, make them my ummah. Allah said, they are the ummah of Ahmed. I'm referring to Muhammad. Then he said, my Lord, I find in the tablets the mention of an ummah who will be the last of people to be created. And they are the first of those who enter the paradise. My Lord, make them my ummah. Allah said, they are the ummah of Ahmad. Musa said, my Lord, I find in the tablets the mention of an ummah whose scriptures are in their chest which they recite. Those who were before them could only read their book by looking in them. And when they closed their book, they could not read it, nor know it. They are capable of memorizing it, which no people of the past could do. My Lord, make them my Ummah. Allah said, no, they are the Ummah of Ahmad. <laughs> Musa said again, my Lord, I find in the tablets the mention of an Ummah who believe in the first book and in the last book. They fight against misguidance till they fight the greater liar of the one-eyed Dajjal. My Lord, make them my Ummah. Allah said, they are the Ummah of Ahmad. Then Musa said, My Lord, I find in the tablets a mention of an Ummah who could eat their charity and can still be rewarded. But before them, when other people gave something in charity and it was accepted, Allah sent a fire which consumed it. And if it was left, it was eaten by predators and wild birds. And this charity is designed to be taken from their rich to their poor. My Lord, make them my Ummah. Allah said, they are the Ummah of Ahmad. Musa said, My Lord, my Lord, I find in the tablets the mention of an Ummah. If one of them had an intention to do good and he could not do it, he will get the reward of ten to seven hundred folds. My Lord, make them my Ummah. Allah said, They are the Ummah of Ahmad. Musa said, My Lord, I find in the tablets the mention of an Ummah who could intercede and for whom intercession has been made. My Lord, make them my Ummah. Allah said, they are the Ummah of Ahmad. And then he narrates that Musa then threw the tablets down and said, O oh Allah, make me from the Ummah of Ahmad. <laughs> Whose Sunnah do you follow? This is the legacy that we are supposed to aspire towards. And to what extent do I, what extent do you, what extent do we live up to that? This is something that we have to be serious about. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us so much by being in this ummah. We need to live up to a greater potential. We are capable of doing much more, every single one of us, than we are doing right now. We are capable of being much better than we are. We are capable of being more compassionate, more charitable, more kind, more patient than we are. That's the sunnah of the Prophet that we follow. That's what we need to be aware of. May Allah, a few announcements before I finish. Uh, there's an event at 5 p.m. tonight. Uh, it's called What Everyone Needs to Know About Prophet Muhammad in 30 minutes. So it's relevant. Uh, so it should be very good. 
Uh, it's going to be at 5 p.m. It's going to be a 30-minute presentation by uh, Dr. Mokhtar Khan, and then there's going to be Nasheed by uh, third year students and also Brother Shahid Bajwa. Please come to that. Uh, please donate whatever you can to help Tarbiya. Uh, alhamdulillah, they met the first year's goal of raising $350,000 and so <coughs> progress is being made towards the second year's goal of raising money. Um, and then lastly, uh, please try to come to Jamaat as much as possible. That, uh, you know, is narrated that whoever prays Isha in Jamaat you know, they get the reward for having performed the ibadat half the night. And whoever prays Fajr in Jamaat gets the reward for having prayed half the night in ibadat. So if you pray both in Jamaat, you get the reward for spending the entire night in ibadat. And if you can definitely make it to Fajr, if you can, you know, right now we only have maybe like five, six people at Fajr time. And it would be nice if we could have more people show up. Around 6.10 is when we call the Iqamah. And afterwards, there's really nice halaqa by uh, Imam Shadi that he does every Friday, every morning after Fajr. That's really beneficial. So if you can please come to any of those things, that would be uh, very good. <coughs> please forgive us for our sins. O oh Allah, please make us worthy of being in the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O oh Allah, enable us to live up to the legacy of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O oh Allah, enable us to aspire to his Sunnah. O oh Allah, enable us to be more like the Sahaba. O oh Allah, enable us to be more like the Tabi'een. O oh Allah, please have mercy on our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering. O oh Allah, have mercy on our brothers and sisters around the world who are starving. O oh Allah, have mercy on our brothers and sisters in Iraq, in Syria in Philistine, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Congo, in Rwanda, O oh Allah, in, in Burma, O oh Allah, have mercy on all our brothers and sisters. O oh Allah, there are people around the world who are doing very bad things in your name. O oh Allah, please prevent them from doing bad things in your name. O oh Allah, enable us to be people who are worthy of the legacy of your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O oh Allah, let us be an example to the people around us. O oh Allah, enable our communities to grow. O oh Allah, enable our children to grow and receive good educations. O oh Allah, enable us to have good livelihoods and be charitable. O oh Allah, please forgive us for all of our sins. O oh Allah, please remove any racism, any hatred, any prejudices from our hearts. O oh Allah, please remove any desire for worldly things from our hearts. O oh Allah, make our hearts be directed only towards you and let us be people who do things only for your sake and your sake alone. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fil akhirati hasanata wa kina zaadil nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil ajzati amma yasifun wa salaman ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ibadullah, inna Allah ya'amunu bil adli wa ihsani wa ita izil qurba wa yinha'an al-fahshai wa al-munkari wa al-baq. Ja'izdukum la'allakum tazakkaroon. اذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه يزدكم واتقوه يجعل لكم مخرجا وقم الصلاة My lovely brother and sister this will be a request as everybody know we have faith for space to raise